Coming up on This Week in Books, is J.K. Rowling working on more Harry Potter books? Plus, will you soon be able to lend books to your friend on your Kindle? And our interview with author Seth Harward. All that and more coming up on This Week in Books, starting right now. Welcome to This Week in Books, episode number 20. Uh, Last week I made a mistake. I said that was episode number 20. This is the real episode number 20. Um, So uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, First of all, Storm On Demand, stormondemand.com. Storm On Demand provides all the video streaming for all of our network. Uh, Basically, all the shows that you're seeing on thisweekend.com are being served up by Storm On Demand. So we always like to thank them at the top of each show. Um, I'd also like to thank TriCaster. Uh, TriCaster is the device that we use uh, to broadcast all these shows. Uh, We like to say it's the flux capacitor that makes thisweekend.com possible. So uh, very happy with TriCaster. Recommend them, love them. Uh, If you're doing a web television show of your own, I suggest you use them and look them up. Uh, So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our guest today, uh, a personal friend of mine, uh, a fellow uh, authorpreneur, as I like to say, uh, author Seth Harwood. Seth, how are you doing? Good, man. I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me on again. Hey, man, my pleasure. You were on a, a past show, I guess it was maybe a year ago, something like that, right? Yes, and I got to actually be there in the studio with you, so that was a thrill. Yes, you're very tall, too. I think uh, it's, people probably can't, you don't look tall on Skype, but in real life, uh, you're like, what, I six? know, I try to represent that on <laughs> uh, on the computer screen, but it's harder to do. Yeah, you're like six, what, six, five, six, six, something like that? Yes, yeah. exactly. Like, literally, I'm not joking, that's not like a, a made-up thing at all. Um, no. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, this is a big day for you. So you released a book today called Young Junius. So you, yes, you have Young it with Junius you, right? Yes, is now out. What? So you, yeah, you had a, I saw you had a copy. You were holding it up while I was doing the intro. Yeah. So hold Young up. Young Junius is now out. This is uh, the hardcover. Oh, wow. You guys got awesome. Yes. Yeah, Searing, a black comedy of murderous errors. Harwood pulls no punches. Yeah, that's from Publishers Weekly. So you're getting some really great reviews. Uh, here's another one from Booklist. Uh, Harwood's cutaway view of a single bloody day and a housing project is an impressive feat. Harwood's empathy runs deep in de- deeply indeed. Uh, and that's from Booklist. So you're getting great reviews. Uh, today is the first day that the book is actually available uh, on Amazon and elsewhere. Is that correct? No, it's been available for a little bit. Uh, it's been out. I've been doing a couple readings in the Bay Area. Next week I'll be reading in Boston and New York. Uh, and we, it's been available on Amazon for about a week now. For pre-order. And I wanted to make sure that it was fully out before I really did the big launch pop. Got it. Okay. Uh, but it was a little late because you were originally plugging October 18th, correct? Yes. And so, okay, so now it's out. Now anyone can go get it. Uh, It's called Young Genius. What is it all about? Tell us what the book's about. So I'm really excited about the book, and I'm excited that these reviews are coming in that sort of recognize some of the the sort of deeper characterizations in the book. This book is about uh, basically a series of drug deals gone wrong in the late 1980s in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's a bit of a prequel to my first book, Jack Wakes Up, where it follows the origin story of one of the characters named Junius Pons, who shows up in San Francisco and Jack wakes up. But here we find him in Cambridge uh, in the early in the late 80s. Um, and what happens is that there's a series of project towers, three of them, that he goes into and gets involved in trying to avenge the murder of his brother. Basically, what we get is the view of this day gone wrong from a lot of the different characters in the tower. I like to kind of think of it as the wire meets Boston departed a little bit. Okay. And, um, and so you're, so this is an action book. You like to describe your books as action. I know for a while you were describing the, uh, the Jack Palms book as crime. We we had a discussion about this last time and you found that some people were like, Oh yeah, I don't like crime. And you were like, well, do you like action movies? Do you like, you know, and, and people go, oh, yes, I love action movies. You know, all the same kind of movies that are sort of in the same <laughs> genre as Jack Wakes Up. And you, you suddenly found that when you described it as action that suddenly people could, then they related to it. So this is the same sort of thing. Am I right? Or Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I like to think of them as crime fiction novels. But within crime fiction, people talk about mystery. They talk about hard-boiled, all these different designations. But, yeah, I mean, basically I think they boil down to, to being more like action movies or if you're a fan of The Wire or Dexter or Sopranos, uh, I think that you'll find a lot of similarities between those shows and long um, characterization narratives with Young Junius. 
Got it. Okay. Um, and so now let's talk it's about action. The, it's just got action. action, guns, sex, drugs. So if there's a, what what movie would you say is probably I don't know the closest and and feel to uh, Young Genius? Oh man, that's a good question. Uh, Machete with Robert Rodriguez. Really, a Rodriguez uh, film? No, huh? I just saw that recently and like it. Maybe like it's a little bit like Juice with old Tupac and stuff like that, but it's actually a good. It's actually well done as opposed to the way that movie was done. I right. hope it's well done, but yeah. the characters are, are a lot deeper than the ones in Juice. Okay, so um, so I want to talk about so no, uh, explain to us how this book became published. Because you've, you've done something very non-traditional in how you're putting this book out. So I'll just, let's just talk about the business of putting this book out for a moment. Uh, describe uh, what you're up to with uh, releasing this book. A lot of different things. I mean, yeah, it's like you were saying initially, the authorpreneur. I mean, you know how it is, and hopefully your viewers are starting to find out. But this is kind of how things have to go now, I think, in the publishing world. Right. Uh, basically, what happened with Jack Wakes Up was that it came out and they had an option on the second Jack Palms book, but I had this novel, Young Junius, that I had podcasted. Right. Um, I released all of my books as free podcasts on my website, sethharwood.com. They're all basically audio books serialized for free on there. And a lot of people had listened to Young Junius, really enjoyed it. And I got an opportunity to work with a small publisher called Tyrus Books, who used to be known as Bleak House Books. And uh, rather than going to them or waiting to find out what was going to happen with the sequel to Jack Wakes Up, I wanted to go out with Young Junius. And so I did that, um, brought it out with those guys. And one of the things that I was able to do by working with a small publisher was basically open the, just open the floodgates for all the different things I wanted to do to promote it online. Uh, so around the release, now I've been doing a lot of interesting things. But initially what I was able to do was sort of take a page out of Scott Sigler's book I know he's been on your show a couple of times as well, and yeah. I basically steal a lot of my tricks from him. But uh, so what we did initially was pre-sell um, a special limited edition, special edition of the book that had some bells and whistles. It had like special artwork on the special cover work on both sides. Yeah, we're going to show. Cover. I'm going to show the video actually that you have up on your site, uh, where you sort of walk through the whole book. It looks really nice. Yeah, actually, why don't we do this? Why don't we, why don't we take a break? We're showing it now? Okay. Yeah, let's, let's take a break and show it right now. I'm here with the Young Junius Special Edition, which has just arrived at my house. I'm not exactly writerly looking. I just carried up all these boxes from the car. We've got the new dog here. we got a lot of packing supplies over there to send all of these copies out to you. All of these little boxes and bubble wrap are going to come to you. We've got all these boxes of books. A whole ton of them in there. And now I'm going to actually open it on camera and let you see the first time that I see the Young Junior Special Edition. This is pretty exciting. A little drum roll on the rock bands. And this is what the book is Opening the first box of Young Junior Special Edition. All the bells and whistles, the hard cover, the beautiful. You gotta do. You gotta come show this. Look at the shine and the gloss. All of these beautiful copies wedged in there together. Go find it. Beautiful. Let's take a look. Pulling out the first one. The cover is a little bumpy. It's got the spot gloss on the name. Shiny back cover, Bob Ostrom, Young Junius as well. No ISBN, no back cover copy. We don't need that for you guys. We just got the front cover, the back cover. Let's look at the inside. Oh, the embossed Seth Harwood signature on the front. I had really signed my name sloppily, but look at how cool that looks. We got the gold, the silver on the thing, the silver rub my name in there. A little black, a little red. Very nice. Bookmark ribbon so that you can remember where your place is. That's awesome. Bookmark ribbon. Picture of me in the back. Taken by Mark Coggins. Let's look at this bookmark ribbon. Oh. 
Chapter 19, Inside the Station. Oh, a red ribbon. This lovely red ribbon, just like the old people used to make. We've got the signed and numbered thing. Signed by your boy. I'll be signing all of these to you guys. And let's look here in the middle. We've got the inserted photographs of the scenes from the novel. That's the Ringe Tower. More shots of the Ringe Towers. Some of these taken by me. We've got the Food Master, the stairs, the cold Alewife Parkway, Porter Square Tea Stop, and the towers. We hope you make it home. In the section breaks of the book, we have silhouettes of the towers to let you know what you're dealing with. And this is the special edition. Cover art on both sides. Little stuff to rub. If you don't find it, fanciness. I don't even know why Very exciting. Smells like beautiful book. Can't wait for you guys to get your hands on these. So it has that new book smell to it, I see, huh? I love that smell. There's nothing like the smell of your own book in the morning. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a beautiful book. I mean, I actually, um, while I was doing research for this interview, I had not seen that video before. And uh, yeah. I saw that, I got excited. I was like, there was like an infomercial for, you know, a really high quality book. And I just, uh, there's the physicality of the book and the, the care and, uh, that had gone into creating it. Um, I got excited about that as, as you know, e more so even in some ways than the story, right? Because it's just, it just looks great. And, and you really sell, you know, the physicality of the book, which is, which I find it very interesting because uh, this is counter to the trend of uh, books being electronic and appearing on Kindles yeah. and Nooks and iPads and things. So, so talk a little bit about, about the physicality of the book and what led you to do it that way. Yeah, I mean, you know, watching that video there, I haven't really gotten to sit down and watch it either. And so watching it as you show it there, like, yeah, the it just, you know, it shows the book really well. Um, that I filmed that video when I first got those boxes and basically 200 of them came to my house and I had to sign and uh, uh, ship them out with the help of some friends in a couple of days. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, we're in a place now where readers have a lot of different options about how they're going to read a book how they're going to engage in that storytelling or story listening reading experience and um, you know one of my goals as a writer has always been to be in all of those different places so whether it's an iPhone app book or Kindle book or Nook or any of those things I want to be able to do that but this publisher that I was working with always publishes their book in hardcover and trade paper but what I saw that Scott Sigler had done that I really liked was to pre-sell pre a special edition of the book. So what we did here was we just talked to the printer and asked them what we could do that would be pulling out all the stops and making this book look just as nice as we could make it. Now, did you do um, this? So did you do this through your publisher, or was this something your publisher yeah. signed off on, but you did it by yourself? Well, I did a lot of the putting it together myself. Some of the pictures that you see in there are photos that I took. Other ones are are from friends of mine. Um, and basically, I worked closely with the publisher. Because it's a small publisher, I was able to just talk to the two people there and really work with them, come up with this plan ourselves. And the thing that I liked a lot about how Scott did it was that by putting it out ahead of time, telling people what the book was going to be and how it was going to look, we were able to pre-sell a bunch of them. Right. We pre-sold about 200 of them in May and June. Uh, and you know that was able to finance a pretty good chunk of the print run for the entire run of books, the hardcover, the trade paper, and the special edition. And it's been able to finance some, some publicity and marketing for me as well, which has been exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, so there's really no risk here. I mean, you, you pre-sold the books, so uh, you don't have to exactly. worry about having a warehouse full of books, which is exactly what Scott Sigger did that with The Rookie just most recently. Yeah. Uh, but he did, he did his He's done that with The Rookie and The Starter two years in a row. And the thing that I really like about it is that basically, you know, he covers his whole cost before uh, he ever goes to press. Right. And what we were able to do here was actually judge the print run size for the special edition based on how many we sold 
So uh, we don't even have the, the sort of difficulty of trying to sell any more of those, although, you know, there's a lot of demand for them out there, which is exciting to see as well. Now, hopefully people will wait until next year. And when I do my next book with Tyrus, they'll be just as excited to get the special edition of that because they know it's going to look great as well. Right. OK, so um, so this book, uh, Young Genius, it's been on uh, it's been podcast. It's a podcast audio book or a audio book. Uh, available as an mp3 downloadable on your site is also on on uh patiobooks.com like a lot of the authors we've had on the show um right and it's it's totally free you can download it listen to it on your on your uh, ipod or whatever um so and you're also giving away a free pdf of the book as well right so i can just go to your site and download the pdf right now and load it into my kindle is that correct yes and that's exactly you're basically doing like what cory doctorow did uh, back in the day uh, when he gave away a free PDF of Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom uh, and Tor Books amazingly let him do that. Um, so, I, I, so, so your publisher, was your publisher reticent about doing that initially or were they okay with it? How, how did they feel about that? They were a little bit reticent, but I basically, I mean, basically, you know, they know that I've done a lot of stuff online and probably know a little bit more about this than they do at this point. So, um, you know, it, we're just... So Jack Wakes Up basically came out twice with two different publishers. The first time, the publisher let me give away the free PDF, and we gave away a ton of them. With Random House, they only let me give away the first three chapters, and it was much less popular as a download. Right. Now I've been giving away the free PDF of the whole book for just less than two weeks now, and it's already right around 40,000 downloads. Wow, that's a lot of downloads. Um, yeah, I'm excited about that. You know, guys like J.C. Hutchins, Scott Sigler... Uh, Mer Lafferty and P.G. Holyfield have been helping by putting out the PDF on their sites as well. I've actually been just letting them put it out on their sites alone. But now that we're talking about it here and people are going to go to my site, I'll put it up right right now. Yeah. Well, I'm going to put it up, uh, by the way, in the show notes for this this uh, particular episode of This Week in Books. I'll put the PDF up in the show notes. So if you're watching this on iTunes, if you go to thisweekend.com slash books uh, and look for this episode of Seth Harwood, uh, Click on it, and you'll go to the show notes, and there'll be a link to the free PDF. So you can go down, go and download it right now if you haven't already. Um, so here, here's what I was thinking, though, about the free PDF, is that when uh, Cory Doctorow initially did it, um, gave away a free PDF of his book, uh, as well as a lot of other folks, there weren't Kindles out there. There weren't, or at least they weren't that popular yet. Kindle, Kindle 2 hadn't taken hold yet. Uh, there weren't iPads out there. Uh, reading eBooks was nowhere near what it is now. It's, we've seen a big sea change just in the last year. Um, so I would think that uh, putting a, a free PDF uh, now might be dangerous. It might actually eat into actual sales uh, because I personally consume books now on my iPad using the Kindle app. That's my preferred method of reading. Um, and if I can get the free PDF, I'll just load it onto my iPad, uh, whereas I, I might have bought it. Uh, but a year ago, I guess what I'm saying is a year ago, um, I would if I had a free PDF, I would have to read it on my computer, which is not an enjoyable reading experience. That sort of I have to sit at my desk and, and, and that sort of thing. Do you th so all that having been said, do you think e the pre the prevalence of e-readers out there right now, devices, uh, makes the free PDF strategy da more dangerous? Um, I don't. I mean, I think it comes back to this whole sort of theory in the publishing industry that if you're giving something away, it's going to cannibalize your sales. And I don't look at it that way. I look at uh, giving something away as an opportunity for more people to come in contact with my book more people to read it. And my trust is that they're going to like it when they read it. And, you know, I don't see that as a possible loss for me. Maybe they like it and they decide to buy it. Maybe they like it and they tell about it. They talk about it with someone else who doesn't have a Kindle and wants to read it as a book. You know, just the fact that they're out there talking about it. I think word of mouth is mainly the only really great way to sell books at this point. And if I can make that happen by giving away the book for free as a PDF, I'm happy to do it. At the same time, I think there's a pretty, it, we're still at a stage where there's a big difference between uploading a PDF onto your Kindle and reading it there and the quality of reading an actual Kindle book on your device. Right. Um, yeah, I'd say that's true now. I, I think that's, that gap's going to close quick, more quick, pretty quickly, though. Um, One of the things that I've noticed when I read PDFs on there is that you can't really adjust the size of the text. Right. So I find myself like turning the Kindle sideways and reorienting it that way. It's sort of more of a pain. Yeah, well, right now you have to, I mean, for those of you who don't own a Kindle, you have to upload the PDF uh, to, a, to your Amazon account, and then it will convert the PDF into the Kindle file format, whatever that is. I can't remember the name of it. Um, and then it will then download it in that converted uh, version to your Kindle. So it's a bit 
it's not quite seamless and it's not quite easy, and the conversion process isn't uh, perfect. So there, there are sometimes stray letters and little weird floaty things in there that don't belong there. It's, it's almost like uh, optical character recognition. It works like 90-ish, 90% 90 of the time. It's sort of the way it is. That's been my when you, So when you do that, have you been able to control the, I mean, one of the things that I like about the Kindle is being able to control the font size and it sort of reflows the whole book, but I've never been able to do that with a PDF on my Kindle. Have you? Uh, I don't know, actually, but I actually, uh, hmm. I don't remember how, I don't remember that actually OCRs it or not. If it does, then it would make sense because then it's, it's got it in a binary format. And so then it would be able to reflow the book just like a regular Kindle book. Uh, it may, it may simply take a pic, it may just simply take a picture. In other words, you might just be looking at a series of GIFs, essentially. Uh, where there's words on it, but the Kindle is not intelligent about what those words actually, uh, what, the, what, the what the ASCII characters actually are. Um, That's what I think is happening. Yeah. I think that is what's I, happening. I, because with a PDF, you know, it's not really scanning in the direct text. It's more of like, like images. Yeah, PDF is an image format, so that would make sense, actually. Um, yeah, so I think there's still a big gap there. Um, and so, you know, from my point of view, there's still an advantage to buying it on the Kindle. Uh, so that you can have that much more ease of use in reading it on your device. But I also think, I mean, the main point here is that um, if you give someone a free copy of the entire book, I think they're more likely to give it a shot than if you just give them the first three chapters free. Right. And so, you know, where we have low budgets for publicity and advertising and publishing and where our avenues for successful publishing are shrinking, I see giving away something for free as, you know, one of our better shots at uh, reaching potential readers. Yep. Well, you've done a really great job of, of exciting your readers and making them, in, getting them invested in, in the book success uh, almost as much as you are. Um, you've, you've basically done a great <laughs> job of recruiting, right? Um, so I want to show... I don't, there's an animated GIF that you had on your site that I thought was really awesome. I don't know if we, if we can put that up there. It'd be great. Yeah, this was awesome. I, I looked at this, and basically these are shots of your fans. I guess what you did is you had them send in their photographs of themselves with your book. Well, I'll let you tell the story. It's your story. Let, tell us what we're looking yeah, at. Yeah, so I mean this is the first cop. This, so I have two sections on my website where people are holding up their books. This is from the first release of Jack Wakes Up. So that's the original edition that Breakneck Books did, which is significant because the cover art for this one was done by one of the, the listeners, Jerry Scullion, who ultimately wound up, there's Rob Walsh, by the way, yep. podcasting guru. Uh, but, you know, uh, Jerry Scullion did the cover art for this one and wound up doing the cover art also for Young Junius, which I'm really excited about. But, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, these people love being on the site. I love having pictures of them with their books. Um, and it's just been, you know, really encouraging and exciting for me to have this interaction with the fans have them reading the book, but also excited to buy it and support me and my career. Yeah. And that's what enabled me to do the thing with the special edition. Now I'm already getting pictures of people who are uh, shooting pictures of them with their copies of Young Junius. A lot of people have been posting copies of the special edition just by itself, I think because they're really impressed with how it looks. Yeah. Uh, and I keep emailing them back and saying, like, put your face in it. I want to see you with the book. <laughs> so I'm starting to get those now. And uh, I'm starting to develop a, a Facebook page called I Bought Young Junius, and I'm putting all the pictures up onto that. Oh, great. Yeah, there's, a, uh, there's actually a fan video. I think, it's, I think it's Young Junius. If we can roll the fan video, that would be great. <laughs> I love this one. All right, what do we got here? Nah, Jack wakes up, read that one. Mm, that was good. Ooh. What's this? Young Junius, right here. Special edition. See that? Number 77, for the boy from Belcher. Can't wait to hear what you think of the read on this book, man. Revised. Who's your boy? My boy said, oh, and I'm a proud Palms dad. Young Junius. 
That's really fun. I, I, now, how do you get these people so excited? How do you get them so engaged? I love that. I love that video. You know what's exciting about that, too, is that the music from that video, so that video was filmed by a guy who's in Western Massachusetts. The music that he played on that video was done by a guy in L.A. who's also a fan of the podcast and makes his own songs about some of the characters. Wow. So there's like a whole, it's a whole young genius uh, uh, empire out there that, that has, has sprung up around you. <laughs> Uh, people well, it's just been really gratifying to see these people excited about the book, showing the book, responding to the story, and also creating their own stuff around it. I mean, to have this guy create a song that he's written about the characters from the book uh, that actually references events in the book and stuff like that, it's awesome. Yeah. And to see this, and to see David making that video, I should mention that Satch Ill Page is down in LA, is the one who made the song, and uh, David Hayes is the one who made that video. You know, it, it, these are just people I'm connecting with online who are excited about the free content. I mean, this, I guess, is what my overall point is, that you can't buy this kind of word of mouth or encourage readers to do this kind of word of mouth with some sort of traditional advertising scheme. But by giving them content for free, whether it is the PDF or these audiobooks that I've serialized by recording myself and giving out for free, uh, there's a real camaraderie and relationship that's developed between me and the readers and listeners. And, you know, that's what gets them to go out there and go the extra mile or gets them to actually help me try to sell the book. And um, I don't think you can buy anything like that. No, I, I think you're right. Um, okay, so one last question before we move on to our next segment. Um, so you, you also do this author boot camp with uh, Scott Sigler, and I think you do it at Stanford. You, you, you teach at Stanford, correct? Are you still there? Yeah, I teach, I teach creative writing here at Stanford and at City College San Francisco. Yeah. And so now, uh, is the author boot camp still running? What's going on with that? What's the latest there? Right now, I'm doing online versions of the author boot camp. We're taking a break from doing it with Stanford to let the audience replenish here in the Bay Area. Um, but I've started doing it online, uh, and people can find out more about that at authorbootcamp.com. I'm currently running a session of it uh, through a Facebook group, and that's been really successful. So if you're an author out there and you want to learn how to do what this guy has done, Seth and, and Scott, uh, both of them actually. They've done it, they've, they've blazed the trail. Uh, you'll teach them all the, the, the secrets and the tricks and the tips. And uh, do you charge for this? Is this something you charge for or is it free? Or yeah, the, we charge for the author bootcamp. Uh, but what we do in the class is we, you know, we teach you how to podcast and record your own stuff. We teach you how to manage your website. And you know, a lot of sort of cutting edge techniques about how to engage with an audience like I have and like Scott has and like you have. Yes, we're not here to talk about me, not yet. Don't sell yourself short. Couple months, couple months. So <laughs> <laughs> then you won't be able to shut me up. Um, so let's let's move on to our next segment now, which I like to call "What You Reading." So what is on the uh, the Seth bookshelf right now? What do, what do you read other than your own stuff? Oh, uh, right now I'm reading uh, this book called Water Ghosts, which is by a friend of mine in the Bay Area, who's mm -hmm. named Shauna Yang Ryan. She did a similar thing where her book was released by a small press here in California. Uh, it got a lot of great reviews, and it was ultimately picked up by uh, Penguin and released last year in hardcover and now just came out in paperback. And I'm reading it now and really enjoying it. Hmm. Okay. Are you a, are you a read one book at a, or a time kind of guy, or are you like some of our previous guests who have like five or six going at a time? It, you know, it depends. Right now I'm dealing a lot of, with my classes, and so I'm, I'm reading stuff like uh, – Angels in America, Tony Kushner yep. with my class. I just did uh, Passing by Nella Larson, which is an awesome book from the Harlem Renaissance that you guys should check out if you haven't already. Now, see, these, um, are, not, these are not what I would think would be Seth Harwood books. I, I thought we were going to see, you know, uh, basically like the literary equivalent of Machete. And, uh, I love Machete. <laughs> well, no, you know, I mean, I've like got that. some Lawrence Block over there that I'm waiting to get to, and I'm really excited to read the new Tom Franklin book, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter, which I'll get to as soon as I finish up some of this class stuff. But, yeah, I mean, towards the middle of the semester like this, I really get caught up in um, the reading that, that sort of sustains my classes. So, right. you know, in the spring, I've taught a class called Detective Fiction a couple of times. And so there I get to read the Lawrence Blocks and the Raymond Chandlers and the Dashiell Hammett right. and, um, you know, all that good stuff. And then at other times, you know, I'm reading different kinds of stuff. I like to, I like to keep it broad. And I, and I hope that readers who read Young Junius will see some of the more literary traditional influences in this book as well. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, The Wire is a big influence for me. 
Um, guys like David Simon and Richard Price, you know, I think Richard Price just does amazing things in book li- books like Clockers and Lush Life. Um, you know, but also uh, I'm a big fan of Juno Diaz, Raymond Carver, Richard Ford, a lot of those guys. I mean, there's a lot of great writing out there to read. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So let's move on to our next segment, which is the news. Uh, big news day. Really big news day today. Uh, today, Barnes & Noble unveiled uh, at a big event. Uh, where they unveiled the $249 Nook Color. So I don't know if you've seen it yet or not. Here, I'll, let's put a little picture up of it if you haven't seen it yet. Um, sort of looks like, uh, it sort of looks iPad-y in a, lot, in a lot of ways. Yeah, there we go. So there it is, the Nook Color. Uh, it has a touch screen. Uh, obviously, it's a sharp color screen. It, is, it's, it, it has a backlit display, LCD. Um, it looks really nice. Uh, it's seven inches in size. Uh, it has some interesting uh, features in it. So basically, if you take the Nook into a physical Barnes & Noble store, uh, while you're in the store, for an hour every day, you can read uh, any book you want, uh, the full thing. Uh, it's sort of, you know, so it, they're basically trying to use their brick-and-mortar stores uh, as an advantage in the digital publishing world. Um, so that, that is, you, you understand what I'm saying? So basically, if you take, your, if you take this, this Nook into the store, into a Barnes & Noble, you can essentially uh, pick up, you can, you can download and read any book in the store or in their ebook store and read it while you're in the book, while you're in the store. If you leave the store, you can't do it anymore. Um, and they sort of set, uh, set it at a rate of an hour a day. So you don't just like hang out in, in Barnes and Noble eight hours a day and read all their books. So they have to put some sort of limit on it. But it's interesting because they're, they're trying to basically make it more valuable in some ways than the Kindle. Amazon does not have a brick and mortar store. So this is a way in which they're trying to, you know, Use, use their strengths to their advantage. Um, really interesting that there was a lot of different uh, reactions to it today. Um, uh, TechCrunch h- hated it. They said, uh, see you later, Nook, or something like that was the article title. They, they think it's a terrible idea. Um, it's essentially an Android tablet, except uh, with one app on it, is sort of how they described it. So underneath the hood, it is, it is in fact, an Android tablet. Um, but you can't use any other uh, applications on it. It's completely locked. Um, so it's and, purely a reading device. Yes, it's purely a reading device. Um, and so you can't, uh, you know, I'm sure people are going to root it, and I'm sure there's going to be all kinds of, you know, versions of it floating around that aren't just a, re- a purely reading device. But right. 250 bucks essentially, let's just call it 250 because really that's what it is. So it's half price of a Kindle, right? You're, you're or sorry, of, a, of an iPad, uh, which is, of course, yeah. a much more fully functional device, which also has the Kindle app on it and can function much the same way. So, and Kindle has come down a lot in price now, right? Yes, it has. Well, the Kindles are now f- are floating just over $100. So you can get them for like, I think it's like $125 or something like that now. Um, yeah. They're not I'm pretty skeptical that. about this Nook. I'm pretty skeptical. I mean, you, I, I, ostensibly, you could walk into a Barnes & Noble store and read any book in their thing in the actual paper form, oh, my God, for as long as you want. You can buy a coffee, sit there and read. Yeah. You can hang out between the stacks. Uh, I don't see this one hour thing being a big plus other than the idea that potentially, you know, maybe uh, ideally the Barnes and Noble ebook store would be bigger and have a larger, um, have have more of a series of books, have more books on tap for you than their physical stores. You know, the big thing about the Barnes and Noble physical stores is that they recycle their books and send them all back to the factory and back to the printers, right. you know, every six or eight weeks. Uh, but, you know, if you can read it there in the store and it's got everything back in their warehouse, maybe that's better. But with the Kindle, you can um, download sections of a book, the first few chapters, and read them anywhere you are. Right. Um, so I don't really see that that's a big advantage for the Nook. I'm, I'm sort of lost as to why someone would want to spend $250 on this thing to make it color. I mean, it's not like you're reading a lot of picture books on these things anyway. So mostly it's black and white text. Um, well, one of the so they had a little video that they put out today. Um, one of the big things that they highlighted was children's books. So they yeah. have you know, which is which is basically also the iPad did the same thing uh, with their iBook store. The book that you can get for free that comes with it is Winnie the Pooh, uh, which is a color illustrated book, right? So they're they're really trying to use the best of their features to their advantage to knock the Kindle out. Um, and so so the way the playing field looks right now, uh, Barnes and Noble's Nook has uh, two million titles available for it immediately. Um, Kindle. The Kindle has, uh, I, I don't recall what it is, but it's a huge selection. It's, it's basically whatever's in, uh, it's, what is that? What's in Amazon? So More than 2 million? 
uh, sorry, Barnes and Noble has two million. I believe it is more. I actually don't have that number in front of me, but I believe uh, Amazon still has more than two million titles available. Um, well, when the I, when the iPad first came out, I was doing a lot of blog posts on a website called Open Culture. Yeah. Uh, sort of at talking about the pros and cons of the iPad and whether the iPad was going to be an iPod for books and and a lot of the and comparing it to the Kindle. And a lot of the feedback that I got from that was people who were vehemently defending their Kindle. Like, I want a reading-only device dedicated just to reading, and I want to use it just for reading. And really? so, you know, there's a lot more that you can get with an iPad, but for me, the price point is really key there. You know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna get a reading-only device, for a long time, I thought that the Kindle was way too expensive. And I think you know, getting down to close to a hundred is probably about right for what I think. Yeah. Especially considering that they don't give you free books with it or convert any of the titles that you've already bought on Amazon into free Kindle titles for you. But, um, you know, I think 250 is really expensive. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. Now, you're basically paying for the color there, I think, in the touch screen, um, which, I, you know, if that, is that important? I, I don't know. Uh, I it's think like a cradle to grave philosophy. Like McDonald's will try to advertise to kids. Barnes and Noble is trying to get these kids hooked on reading ebooks now with their parents, so that they can get them when they're young, and then have them read ebooks forever. Right. So and interesting. So, so just going back to what you said earlier. So you had a lot of people who defended the read-only device. Why yeah. would you defend that? Like, what what was it about that? Could you get a, did you get a sense of why they were they were defending it like that? People love their Kindles. That's just it. So it's an irrational love, love of the Kindles. device. The people who own Kindles and use them, and I have to admit, I'm sort of becoming one of them. Oh, I I'm love one. it because it's really easy to buy new books on it. You know, there's been a lot of books that I really thought I would like in the past, and I was kind of afraid of reading them just because of the discomfort of holding a big book in my hand. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Dennis Johnson, Tree of Smoke came out, and it, it was just, you know, I feel like sometimes these books are just too big for me to read comfortably. And so with the Kindle, you don't have to worry about that at all. I was able to read a huge biography of Raymond Carver and all of the Stieg Larsson books this summer on my Kindle. And I've had a great time with it. Um, yeah, yeah I actually, I had the same experience with Cryptonomicon. Is I actually, I actually bought the book. And it's so, yeah. you know, it's huge. For those of you who don't know, yeah. it's like maybe that, that big. Yeah. And it's still on my shelf. But then I downloaded it onto my Kindle. <laughs> and then, and I actually, start, I'm about halfway through it. And then another book came along that I needed to read sooner. But nonetheless, I got about halfway through it. And I, I probably wouldn't have started it otherwise. Yeah, there was another book that I bought, and then I wanted to read it, it on the Kindle, so I just bought it on the Kindle. But also, you might buy a book on the Kindle and then read it, and then think, you know what? This is a really good book. I want to give this guy a little more money. Plus, I'd like to have this on my shelf to develop my beautiful bookshelves. You see, I've heard so that a lot too. A lot of people. I, will yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but a lot of people will, if they love a book, they'll, they'll read it in e-format. It's almost like they feel like they're sampling it, and they don't really own the book yet. And so right. they will then buy the book for the physicality and the beauty of the book. Um, and so all their friends can come in and marvel at their, uh, their awesome bookshelf behind them. So Totally. I mean, yeah. part of the thing about books now is that everyone's saying, like, books are going to go away, everything's going to go the way of the e-book. But there's something about the physical presence of the book and like you know the thing with the you know the smell of the paper and the look of this funky bookmark ribbon uh and you know having these things on your shelf or your coffee table for when your friends come over so that you can use it as a conversation piece i mean nobody's coming over to your house and like scanning through the titles on your kindle and talking to you about that you know actually it's really nice to have a physical book that you can show people and hold in your hand you know i you know, okay, I hear you on that, and I, I, I'm not sure what I think exactly, but the argument, I was just having this exact conversation with someone recently, and uh, the argument to the contrary would be, you and I grew up with physical books. There were no e-books, right? So, yeah. But kids that are coming, growing up now, I think a lot of them will, their first experience of reading will be with a device of some sort. And, uh, and so, but and you're saying, well, there is no bookshelf experience in that universe. I, I disagree. Uh, the bookshelf experience is just somewhere else. It's in Facebook. And it's in Goodreads. Oh. So you still have that same, you know, someone's a bookshelf sort of defines who you are, right? The, the songs yeah. on your iPod say something about you. The books on your shelf or in your Goodreads virtual bookshelf say who you are. Um, so I, I think that still exists, even in, in this world of, of device driven books. It's just sort of somewhere else now. Do you agree I think or disagree? That's a good point. I think that's a really good point. And also, you know, you think about the internet communities that we're a part of. By being on the internet and not just being tied to people that we encounter in our physical experience, you know, we can find people who have much more sort of niche interests like we do. 
Um, and so, you know, if you're watching Lost or something like that and the guy at the water cooler didn't see last night's episode, you're sort of out of luck. But now you can go online and talk to thousands of people about Lost, connect with people on Goodreads who are reading, you know, this obscure novel from the Harlem Renaissance that you're into called Passing or, you know, any number of things. So I, I think that's a good point. And I think, you know, as we go forward, we'll see those communities become more and more a part of our lives and offer us more opportunities to share what we're reading. Yep. So, yeah, I think that's true. I also think that the the it'll take a little while for real books to go away yeah no, I, I agree although we, just last week we had uh, there was an article on CNN where Nicholas Negroponte the, the famous MIT futurist uh, claimed that they will go away within five years uh, simply wrong. for because of economic reasons I think he's wrong too I, I don't think it's gonna he's wrong they won't tip they won't go away completely so uh, but and interestingly enough years. well so okay so great segue to our next story um, so <laughs> this is this is from Amazon uh, just a few months ago, and this is from Read Right Web, by the way, which is where I'm getting this article. Uh, and it says, just a few months ago, Amazon announced that its Kindle editions were outselling hardcover books. Now the Seattle-based online retailer also announced that for its top 10 best-selling books, its customers are now, now buying Kindle editions twice as often as print copies, even as sales of print books on Amazon continue to grow. So um, it's uh, also during the first nine months of 2010, Amazon sold three times as many Kindle books as during the same period in 2009. So um, these numbers are insane. I would have never guessed that uh, it would, they'd be having this much success this soon. Um, so this would actually sort of, uh, I don't know, I guess counter the argument. I mean, ebooks are swallowing uh, regular books. What's your reaction to these numbers? Uh, again, I'm a little bit skeptical. I mean, you're right, they sound really impressive. But when you start to look at some of the top booksellers in the Kindle bookstore, you see things that are priced at like a dollar or 99 cents or sometimes zero or sometimes 2.99. You know, and a lot of the publishers, the big publishers are sort of catching on now that they will sell some of their new releases at discounted rates or give away free versions of some of the backlist for stuff like that. Um, you know, I would be a little skeptical about whether uh, sort of what percentage of the sales that they're talking about reflects titles that are vastly discounted or even given away on the site. Hmm. Okay, so you think that these numbers are inflated or skewed in some fashion? Yeah, I mean, they basically did the same thing around Christmas, and they said, you know, we've sold way more Kindle books uh, around Christmas than we have hardcover, than we have actual print books, and it was kind of the same thing, like spinning it as though Kindle is this big success, and, you know, being a little ahead of the curve of where we think it might be, sort of naturally knowing the industry like you and I do. Um, but what was, what was actually going on with Christmas was that a lot of people were opening these Kindles that they got for gifts and going on there and seeing a lot of free books that they were just jumping all over and throwing onto their Kindle. Um, you know, it took a little while to sort of see what was going on there. And, and there might be something similar going on with these new numbers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fair enough. So let's go on to our next article, which is also uh, about Amazon. Uh, Amazon to introduce lending for Kindle. So a lot of the big objections uh, to ebooks that people have had are, um, you know, when I buy a book and I put it on my shelf, and then when Seth Harwood comes over, and I think this is a book, I've read it already, and I think it's a book he might enjoy, I can lend the book to him, and he can go, it's, it's my right to lend the book to Seth Harwood, because it's my book, I yeah. bought it. And I can give you a copy, right. I can give you my copy, and you can then go and read it and return it, or keep it, or whatever. Um, I, ultimately, I should be able to sell the book maybe to you. If I'm like, you know, look, I already read it. It's a little bit banged up, so five bucks and I'll sell it to you. And because that's what you can do with a real book in the real world right now. So why should I not be able to do that with an ebook? So today, Amazon attempted to answer that crit critique by saying, "Oh, uh, later this year, we're going to introduce lending for Kindle, uh, a new feature that lets you loan Kindle books to other Kindle device or Kindle app users." Um, uh, each book can be lent once for a period of 14 days, uh, and the lender cannot read the book while it's loaned out. So if I have a book on my Kindle and I e-loan it to you, I can't go read it now. Only you can read it. And, but you have, uh, I guess you have only 14 days to read it, uh, which is interesting. Um, and just as an aside, uh, uh, the Nook press release today, the Color Nook, uh, has lending built into it also. So actually, the, the Color Nook today... Uh, they, they beat them. They beat Amazon to the punch. So this is the first time I've actually seen someone slug Kindle in the jaw like this. 
uh, you know, out of the gate. So that was kind of interesting that Barnes and Noble you know, leapfrogged him, at least in lending. So, uh, Seth, what do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's long overdue. I, you know, I'd love to see the Kindle doing something like that. I think it makes sense. I mean, especially as the Kindle book prices are approaching some of those for print books. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more that we can do with print books in terms of reselling them, lending them to friends. My question is, what happens if it takes me more than 14 days to read the book? I mean, it doesn't yeah. seem like there's any loss there. To, I mean, Amazon shouldn't see it as a loss if you can't read it while I'm reading it. I mean, it should be like a one-to-one -one kind of thing. Yeah. But what happens if it takes me more than 14 days? And the thing to point out about all of this that is really important is that, you know, I mean, we can talk about the Nook and, and Amazon Kindle kind of beating one another to the punch about lending, but come on, man, and let's go back to the libraries. There are tons of libraries across the country that will lend you any book, any number of books for as long as you want, and they're dying on the vine out there, and they could use a little bit of our support. Plus, a lot of the libraries have come up with um, online digital technology for borrowing books from them as well, so we shouldn't be selling them short. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, okay, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to go. I'm going to do one more article here, and this is probably the most interesting, or one of the most interesting ones. Uh, article five: Michael Jackson, Harry Potter musical, uh, and more Potter books. So uh, apparently, and this just came out this last week. Uh, Michael Jackson once offered to make Harry Potter into a musical uh, for J.K. Rowling, uh, and J.K. Rowling declined that offer. Uh, the story came out during a recent Oprah Winfrey interview. Uh, special with J.K. Rowling. So this is actually from J.K. Rowling. So we know this is its not a rumor. It's true. Um, and uh, it, was, it was interesting. And, and uh, Oprah said, were you reluctant to increase the empire? And Rowling said, uh, it could be so much worse. Michael Jackson wanted to do a musical. I said no to a lot of things. For me, I love the films. I love the books. But there's elements that I love around it. So uh, interesting. And the other thing that came out of the interview was uh, apparently... Uh, she said, and this is J.K. Rowling said this, um, I definitely could write an 8th, ninth, 10th book. I could easily. Um, so apparently her wheels are, or she's at least starting to, to think about it a little bit. Um, so two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, what, do you think she should have allowed Michael Jackson to make a musical out of Harry Potter or not? Yes, I would let Michael Jackson make a musical out of Young Junius. Actually, <laughs> Kanye West should probably call me but. Because we, I've been thinking about working with him to do a musical of Young Junior. So if Kanye is watching, he should totally hit me up. Kanye's out but, there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the downside of doing the musical is look what happened to T. S. Eliot when Andrew Lloyd Webber did Cats out of his thing. I mean, you know, it's not exactly T. S. Eliot type wasteland kind of poetry, but a lot of people really like Cats. Yeah. I, actually, I did not know that the Cats is based on a T. S. Eliot piece. Really? Yeah, it is. It's based on this really weird little book that he did. Hmm, interesting. Um, and then the second question is, do you think, uh, you know, is J.K. really going to write more Potter books or is this just, perf you know, making conversation? What do you think? Why wouldn't she? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think What's she... What's she going to do? Just sit on the beach in Acapulco for the rest of her life? This is what we do. I mean, we're writers. We write. Uh, if we're farmers, we farm. She yeah. should definitely write more books. Yeah, I think She'll she's... Bored otherwise. Yeah, I, I mean, if for, so for her, because, you know, the, the, we as writers always see our work come out like years after we we sort of we sort of finish a book and right in our our minds it's done we've emotionally gone oh, it's over and then years later uh, even in the best case scenario sometimes two or three years later in the best case scenario more in you know less best case scenario the book actually goes out there and a lot of people read it so what we perceive of as you know Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows came out when like two, a year two years ago. The last Harry Potter book? I can't remember exactly. It was like one or two years ago. I, I, I guess it's the wrong guy. I guess they're not Seth Harwood books, but yeah. I, so I, <laughs> I read it. It was like one or two years ago. I don't remember exactly what. Which means that for Rowling, that was, uh, you know, she probably finished it about four years ago. And so now yeah, she. That. Yeah, so my guess is that. So I, I, I heard this and so I go, oh, I understand. If I, had, if I weren't writing Max Quick books, you know, for a couple of years, I'd be like, I'd be itching to like do another one or do something. I, you know, the yeah. ideas would start coming and I'd, I'd have to do it. And so I, I, I think this is real. I think that she is going to write more books. I think she'll do another trilogy or For something. sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, imagine the pressure that she's getting, not only from her publisher, but also from the audience. I mean, there's tons of millions of people around the world who want more Harry Potter. But on the publishing side, I mean, one of the things that we're seeing is more and more publishers kind of putting their eggs into their major bestseller baskets and, and cutting back on the long shots or the chances that they'll take with new authors or books that they're not so sure about. 
they're just releasing more and more blockbusters or focusing more of their catalog on their blockbusters like Hollywood. And, you know, I'm sure they would love to have more Harry Potter. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I mean, the danger here is, uh, you know, after you've done uh, almost, she's basically pitched a, a perfect game, if you will. Uh, really, in, in my opinion, you know, all seven books were excellent. The possible exception of the fifth, was, which was a little creaky, in my opinion. But other than that, it was uh, a perfectly pitched game. And so the danger is, is if she comes out with, you know, more books, that, the, you know, she pulls a Lucas. And we end up with uh, Phantom Menace, right? <laughs> and, and we're all sort of looking at this going, you know, oh, geez, what happened? Uh, it's, and, you know, so you, you have a chance to mess up your legacy by uh, doing a less than stellar performance on this. So what do you think about you that? You think Lucas would take back Phantom Menace if he could? Uh, you think Tim Lincecum would stop pitching after two Cy Youngs? Yeah, no, I think I don't think I think Lucas thinks it's good. I mean, honestly, I think he's I think he's still behind George R. Banks, and he thinks the rest of the world just doesn't understand. His bank account thinks it's good. Yeah, his bank account does think it's good. So, yeah, Phantom Menace was absolutely a uh, you know financial success. So, anyway, well, listen, Seth, uh, that's all the time we have. I want to thank you very much for being on the show. Let's spend a moment with you. Uh, run through all your how we how do we find you on Twitter? How do we buy your books? Where do we find you online? Give us the give us the Seth Arwood pitch. Thanks a lot for having me on. I'm really happy to be here. You can find all of my stuff at SethHarwood.com. I also produce a weekly podcast of crime writing by other writers at CrimeWave.com. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Seth Harwood, Facebook.com slash Seth Harwood. Uh, there's a Harwood Palms Daddies and Palms Mamas group on Facebook, and I'd love for you to join it or just friend me up on there. If you're interested in buying Young Junius, you can buy it in hardcover or trade paperback. If you go to SethHarwood.com, you will see a list of bookstores that you can buy it at, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Borders, IndieBound. There's a couple of stores in the Bay Area that you can get signed copies, and I would love to sign one for you. <laughs> Very good. Um, so that's all the time we have. Uh, again, thanks to Seth. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. That is the This Weekend Network. Uh, we're at TWI Network on Twitter. Uh, of course, ThisWeekend.com is our website where you can find all of our shows, we're up to 22 shows now, um, so I invite you to come by and check out some of our other shows other than This Week in Books. Uh, a lot of people watch this show on, uh, they pull it down from iTunes, so they, they don't necessarily know about the website. So I always like to remind people that thisweekend.com exists. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, my name is Mark Jeffrey, and uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, we're going to close out with uh, the TriCaster video. See you next time on This Week in Books. You got a web show you want to create. You need something to make you look and sound really great. A lightweight, portable broadcast device For a TV studio, you can't beat the price TriCaster, TriCaster The web television user TriCaster TriCaster, TriCaster The web television user TriCaster Audio mixing and special effects Multi-camera switching digital muscle flex Playback clips on your live remote shoots A chroma key green screen muscle to boot Live production and virtual sets A streaming like a pro across the internet It's made of awesome and it's full of wind The TriCast is what we use it this way again TriCaster, TriCaster The web television is a TriCaster TriCaster, TriCaster Web television user, try